The international monetary system, it's huge. It's, well, covers the whole planet. That's why we call it an international monetary system. It's so complex. You have individual countries. You have the governments kind of in control, usually they are, of what goes on in the country. Sometimes they're not. And that part is the mystery as well on top of that. But you have really separate economies all linked together with nothing more sometimes than the word of the past president or dictator or prime minister, whatever it may be, binding them together because of the fact that we don't have a one world government. Every government acts as its own individual entity and they make agreements sometimes with a neighboring country to the north of them and that agreement is stronger and the one to the south of them, not so much, and the one to the west of them and so on as you go through. It's very diverse, very different and there's a whole series of different aspects how does that tie into you trying to run an international business? We'll talk about that because of the fact that you can have vast differences over a couple different issues that we'll talk about in this section over here that could really make or break your company as you go through. Here's an example as to how we have one area called terrorism. How, how does it get funded internationally? Well, security professionals, they study the ways that terrorism sees money transferred across borders. To some extent, they're following the pattern of legitimate businesses on top of that as well. They just have a different cause and goal in the process. The governments, they send a message to non-bank institutions to stop serving the terrorists. And a lot of them respond as soon as they find out that that happens. And some of them simply don't as you go through. So there's a task force out there, and then we call it the Financial Action Task Force of Money Laundering. But there's a whole series of them across the entire planet that try to deal with that. Here's one example of, of really in the Africa and the Middle East, how funds are transferred through really Hundi or Hawala as it goes through, and it leaves no traces of activity as you go through the process. You'll see there's informal channels of money flows in and out of the country, and really Hawala denotes a system made up of money lenders and businessmen across the entire globe. And sometimes their motivation is pure raw profit, and they make money off of it. Sometimes it's a expanding the cause of their terrorists as they go through. And sometimes terrorists really just, just want to kill people for whatever their cause may be as you go through. Here is actually, it's online, but Hawala goes through and actually is a huge component as to how you fund terrorism. But Hawala is not really a terror funding aspect of it. It has a huge number of legitimate remittances or business transactions go through. It's just that it also, because of the fact it's all done on personal transaction, it also is used for money laundering in its role to support terrorism as it goes through. This paper is available out there if you want to go through, published by Interpol. There are details and documents some of the aspects as to how money transfers across borders illegally using inappropriate methods as you go through. Al-Qaeda and ISIS, this article is from 2021, and, and it's in the process, it talks about how they use cryptocurrency to sit down there and help support this activity. So there's different activities that happen, some good and some bad out there in the process. And you'll see that there's loopholes between the aspects because economies are totally separate and dependent. And people try to find ways to go in between the economies to have their goals done as you go through. One example is the gold standard, which actually is a really solid base to sit down and establish an economy. Pretty much as you go through and look at the gold standard, what happened was you have money, let's say, for instance, $1 million of gold bullion, and it's dumped, and it's, it's a big bridge as you go through, and it's held in a vault in Fort Knox. So for that $1 million, the U.S. sister says, okay, from now on, we have the million dollars of gold, and so we're going to sit down and print bills to represent that, and we'll print out a million dollars in bills that will say, let's put gold notes on them, or let's put gold certificates. And therefore, if you want to, technically, you have this piece of paper in your hand, then you put it in your wallet as you go through, instead of having a chunk of gold in your pocket that could weigh something, but that piece of paper is supported by the gold that's held by the government in a secured place as you go through. So you have that over there, and then the government can also sit this as, okay, by edict, we're gonna sit down and make it 10 to one. So now, a gold certificate, now instead of just being $100, 
piece will sit down and say, okay, the million dollars in gold will sit down there, will support $10 million for the, the different gold certificates. So all of a sudden now you have a different change in standards as you go through. They really operated that way for many, many years as you go through. And finally, we went through and we abandoned that and had the Federal Reserve System in the early part of the 20th century. The gold standard is out there. And a lot of times people turn to precious metals in times of severe economic crisis. So whenever the, the economy is booming, stocks go roaring up and people kind of back off our precious metals because they want to sit down and earn more money by sitting there being on a riskier investment out there in the stock market or other types of securities out there. And then also the economy goes down, oh, everybody panics, buy bonds, buy precious metals. And then the price of gold tends to go up in the process. So, so you have a counter cyclical aspect. Whenever the economy goes booms, booms, the precious metals tend to go down. Whenever the economy goes in, in trouble, then the, the, the price of precious metal goes up. So the gold standard does vary and it serves as a value all the time, especially during crisis as you go through. We abandoned the gold standard in the United States many, many years ago, but right after World War II, we went through the whole, the war was resolved for all practical purposes. We established a system called the Bretton Woods system and 44 countries all signed on board and it really established the United States as the superpower of planet Earth as you went through. It was a nice feather in her cap and I can't believe that there wasn't a lot of ego involved in the process of having us there. The only thing is there's some flaws with that, just like you would any kind of negotiating agreement. But once you sit down there and you're recipient of it, there's good and there's bad about it as you go through. We pretty much had an international monetary system in place all the way to about 1971. And it was based upon the power value on gold and the US dollar. So we had all this going on, life was really good. And then he went through and France decided to say, hey, we want to take our debt that we have. We want your gold, the United States. And finally, we came to a decision in 1971 says, no, we're not going to give you our gold. Sit down there and take your debt yourself. So all of a sudden, the US, instead of being a target, sat there and says, OK, we realize where we are now. So no, you're not going to have our gold, France, or any other country. Take care of yourself. So by the time it was all done, we ended up with an entire system of ways to sit down there and deal with debt between countries as you go through. Fixed exchange rates. We had a whole series of things where we had stated value, par value. There's a lot of different aspects of the, of the, of the Bretton Woods standards. And a couple of things that were there it was the reserves. Assets are held by a nation's central bank and they're used to back up a government's liabilities. That pretty much was how we ran it as a nation as you go through. But France sat down there, instead of them wanting, wanting to do that, they wanted to sit down there. They carried some debt. They wanted to exchange it for US gold, and the US had to make a decision. One of the problems was right in the Bretton Woods Agreement, you had a system that really sat down there and based all the things on gold and US dollar. We had a thing created called the Triffin Paradox, where the national currency that's also the reserve currency, the currency runs a deficit. And then because there's a lack of confidence in reserve currency and there's a financial crisis, then you have to sit down there and really have a problem over how you go about doing that because all of a sudden the reserve currency you have to hold becomes a burden to the holder of that as you go through. And also to make certain you had a system, there was a, a whole aspect of the international monetary funding that you had special drawing rights for international organizations. So that still exists out there. We'll talk more about that later on and the impact on, on global economics as you go through. But the special drawing weight is a unit of account for the, for the International Monetary Fund and international organizations that really sits down and helps you as a country to sit down and have special privileges and drawing rights of money in the aspect of, of, of currency exchanges in the process. It, philosophically, the Bretton Woods system was a nice idea. From a pragmatic perspective, though, it's a little bit like the U.S. wanting to be the world police department, and we're going to sit down and take care of all you bad dictators out there. It also turned around and made us the world's accountant and bank. Two different concepts, the world's police, but also now we became the world's accountant and bank. And by the way, we get into trouble, the U.S. will bail us out. Well, that really isn't how it should work, but that's how it seemed to work to a lot of the world. And we were the, the big superpower. They could depend on us always to assist them to, to bail them out. 
The US dollar is the most used central reserve since the end of World War II on the planet Earth we go through. By us holding large amounts of US dollars, that eventually means they lose value. That's what the Triffin paradox is about. So you really, that was not effective long-term. In the short term, it solved a lot of economic problems and it brought peace economically to the world right after a, a severe time of turbulence of World War II. So the International Monetary Fund, they'd like to have a non-national asset that become a main reserve, and maybe you would too, I think I would in that, that regards, except for the fact that by us being the main asset for a lot of countries, that really helps us be really counted upon worldwide as being the central point for different types of exchange rates. We'll talk about the eight exchange rates later on as we go through. The gold standard, know what that is. Know that the Bretton Woods system, 44 countries, it was based upon the gold US dollar. Have a concept about the Triffin paradox and also know about special drawing rates as you go through. Take care.